but let's kind of go back over the last couple of weeks, and maybe somebody's got a question. The first time, first one that uh, chapter, or the first lesson we talked about a couple of weeks ago uh, was freedom, not sobriety. And, and somebody tell me what we talked about being, and I hope you made some notes, or you've got some notes, what the difference we talked about in freedom and sobriety. Somebody talk about that difference. Go ahead. You can get sober off We can, right, we can make somebody sober again. Yeah. We can lock them up. Uh, we can put them in a rehab, 30, 60, 90 days, 45 days. Uh, they can go live with Aunt Sue or Uncle Tommy in the next state and keep them away from drugs or alcohol or the circumstances that cause the strongholds, the behavior issues that we have. And we can make them sober. Yeah. Just keep them away from whatever it is. But does that take away... That desire, no, it don't. There's still that bonding there. So we're not looking for sobriety. We can get sobriety. We can pay for sobriety. But what we're looking for is freedom. Now, as we begin to go through these lessons, we begin to understand that freedom only comes when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior because He, living inside of us, is the only power that there is to overcome that fleshly desire for addictive behavior and stuff of the stronghold. So we're looking for freedom through Christ, the Holy Spirit living in us, to overcome the destructive behavior, the addiction and destructive behavior. So we want freedom, not sobriety. Uh, something else we talked about in, uh, along the way there a couple, three weeks ago. Uh, underlying causes. Underlying causes. What do we say about underlying causes? The addictive, destructive behavior that we become engaged in is normally usually because of some underlying cause. In other words, we can treat the symptoms, just like a cold. You've heard the doctor say we can treat the symptoms, but we can't stop them from having a cold. See, and when we talk about uh, addictive, destructive behavior and stubborn stronghold, many times we try to treat the symptom, the behavior, but don't really get to the cause, to the root cause. Normally, there's an underlying reason there. And, of course, that turning our life over to Christ begins that process of self-examination right. where we can get to the area where we can find out what the underlying... And there's many, many things. I mean, we've listed... There's hundreds of things. Sometimes it goes all the way back uh, to a childhood incident. Uh, sometimes it goes back to a, a relationship issue in our life. Sometimes it goes to a physical issue that we've had or haven't. Many different things can be the underlying cause. Yeah. Pain, trauma. Pain, trauma, uh, all of those things, emotional things, all of those are underlying causes. So we got to quit treating the symptom and get down to the cause. And again, that's what our life in Christ will help us do because a life in Christ is a life of self examination. Taking God's word and holding it up to our life every day and helping us find those areas in our life that we need to ask Him to help us work with. So we talked about the underlying causes and, and freedom and not sobriety. Then last week, I think it was, we talked about relapse. What happens when we relapse? What does it mean? Re always means what? Start over, go back to the right. So, re, so if we relapse, we can go back. Now, a lot of times we get into the procedure, and I don't want to say habit because it's not necessarily a habit, but we get to that place to where we start, and it's not a bad thing, but we count down days. I've been X number of days, I've been free from whatever. And then all of a sudden we get to the place to where, and we'll talk a little bit tonight about triggers where something happens. And we go back. We use lots of terminology for that. We hear lots of terminology for that. You know, we talk about somebody being back out there. They were good. They were victorious. They were overcoming, but now they're back out there. What do we call it? They say they have relapsed. Well, in Reformers, we teach and we back it up with God's Word that there is a such thing as recovery without relapse. And that happens. <coughs> When we have freedom and not sobriety. Right. I mean, we know that story, don't we? 
I mean, that's why probably some even here tonight have been in countless times. Different relapse, different problem, and different programs, different rehabs, different uh, uh, different things, and over and over and over again, always attaining sobriety, but never attaining freedom. And then the next thing you know, we try to hold on with ourselves, and we can't do it in our own strength. And all of a sudden, we're back off where we start. And that, you know, I told you that these lessons will start, you'll start seeing that terminology more and more that talks about not just addictive behavior, which we recognize, drugs and alcohol, chemicals and things like that, but it talks about stubborn strongholds, which has to do with those emotional things, anger, you know, anger that leads to violence, bitterness, jealousy, uh, all of those sorts of things. Those are destructive as well. Uh, they're very destructive to relationships, and many times, they could even be debilitating and destructive physically. Uh, angry, uh, bitterness, and all those sorts of things. So as we talk more and more and more about not just the addictive behavior, but the destructive behavior that comes from those strongholds as well, the same principles, the same spiritual applications apply. God can deliver from alcohol. God can deliver from drugs. God can also deliver from anger, from bitterness from jealousy, from critical thinking, critical speaking and talking, all those things. And so what we're understanding is sober means also free from those sorts of behaviors in our life. And we can have freedom from those as well. And again, if we've just got some sobriety there, if we've just went to the doctor and the, the counselor and the counselor has helped us work through this time in our life where that's not an issue anymore, really truly all we've done is kind of patted it down and got it calmed down, guess what? We'll relapse. We'll go back into that behavior again. So it's all the same. The spiritual principles are the same. There is freedom versus sobriety, and then there is recovery without relapse, without going back. And so that's important, and the curriculum helps us realize that. Relapse is not part of recovery. What we talk about relapse being setting ourselves up for failure, it's kind of like we Kind of like we've got a guy in a, a excuse in our back pocket. Oh, I, I'm recovered. I'm doing well, but I know there's that chance I'm going to fall off again. I know there's that chance I'm going back to that kind of behavior. What have we done? In our mind and in our heart, we've set ourselves up for that opportunity. For that. Yeah. We've set ourselves up for that opportunity. So there is relapse without recovery. I mean, uh, recovery without relapse. And we. Most of the time when we what we call relapse or go back to that behavior, it's because we're relying on ourselves to do it. Yeah. It's because we're relying. You see, that's all the heart, that's the heart and soul of why are you recovering a faith-based program? Because it teaches us and helps us understand that we can't do it in our own strength. I mean, we do we know that we can. We can only do it through Christ living in us. So that's why when we start trying to do it in our own strength again, guess what? We mess up. You remember so well, Galatians 2.20, and I've talked about it before, that's our, our key verse for performance, Galatians 2.20. And we talked about, uh, he said, nevertheless I live. And he said that Christ now lives in me in the life that I live now. I live because of Jesus Christ and because of him living in me. But then he goes right on in Galatians chapter 3, and he says, but then we think that something that started in Christ, which is salvation, and turning our life over to him, we all of a sudden, somewhere down the road, we get the idea, hey, I got this going, I can grow my own boat oh, you know? And then what happens? We sink. Why? Well, because we're trying to do it in our strength again. It takes that constant, everyday reliance on Christ's strength within us. And so we have recognized that uh, that uh, relapse uh, happens when we try to do it in our own strength and do it ourselves. Tonight, let's talk just a little bit about triggers, kind of get started. Be two lessons and talk about triggers. When you talk about addictive behavior, destructive behavior, and you mention trigger, what, what comes to your mind? What do we think about? What's the trigger? Something that reminds you. Snap and makes you want what, to. What's the trigger on a gun? The part that makes it go bang, right? It makes it shoot, it fires it off. Well, think about it that way. A trigger is something that happens in you. Pull that trigger and fire it off again. <coughs> Talk a little bit about triggers.
triggers. <clears throat> what you believe affects your recovery. What you believe about your addiction or strongholds and recovery without relapse are key factors in determining if you will overcome the, subst the substances or the destructive behaviors. Now, we will live our lives. In, the moment we get saved from Jesus and God take us and put us in a pristine, crystal clear environment where we don't have to worry about dealing with the no. ugliness of the world. No. Does that happen? No. no, it doesn't. In fact, we live in the same world we got saved in. And he told Jesus, told his disciples that he was not going to save us and take us away. He told them when he prayed to God that in the garden that night, right there before he was, uh, before he went to the crucifixion, the resurrection, he said, I pray that you would keep them, don't take them out of the world, but keep them in this world. So when we think about that, when we get to that place to where we celebrate victory and overcoming an addictive behavior or a stubborn stronghold in our life, we don't immediately go away to some never, never land where everything's perfect. No, we're still in the same world. In fact, what we find out, and you know this to be true, that if anything, things start to get, get tougher. They start getting harder. One thing, the moment we trust Christ our Savior, we put a big bullseye on our back. That means Satan's looking to shoot us all the time, pull us out. But we're still living in this environment. So let's talk about the triggers and how that works. You can experience lasting triumph over life's triggers. You know what? Because triggers will always be there. Think about your environment. Part of recovery is learning to properly respond to triggers. Think about your environment for me. You still live in the same house you live in. You still have the same husband or wife or children or family. A lot of times you still work the same job. You still go to the same places for recreation. But now... That Jesus Christ lives inside of you're different on the inside, and you got a different outlook. But all of those things out there are still the same. Think about your job, for instance. You can't go to work tomorrow and tell the boss, the supervisor, the plant manager, whoever, I don't want anybody on this job using this kind of language anymore because that's a trigger and that makes me feel and think and act a certain way. Can you do that? No, mm -hmm. you can't. You get fired. Well, your boss said you get fired, he'll just say, or she'll say, well, you can't get over that. I can't control the way people talk. So, see, we can't go and change our environment completely. Think about it like this, and this is a prayer that gets kind of touchy because it happens many times. Say you're, uh, you're living, you're engaged with someone, you're either married to them or you're living in a relationship with them, and you have decided and you trusted Christ as your Savior. You're going to overcome this this uh, addictive behavior in your life and the strongholds and all. And but what about that partner? What if they're not going to do that? Well, that can make tension in a household, so tension in an environment. <clears throat> so you can't go in there and say, "I want you to change your life," and you start. In fact, we know from experience that happens in those relationships can be dissolved. She or he'll say, all right, you take yourself and you get out. That's the way you're going to do it. So you see, we can't always change the environment and circumstances. Now, we can learn, and many do, and those who are successful do learn that we have to remove ourselves from certain kind of circumstances and environment. That means that I've had reformers here, and you probably know some, some of you here, immediately found out, figured out, hey, i got to change my job. <laughs> i got to go work. This environment is a trigger for me. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes the guys <coughs> that you work with are the ones that kind of help y'all get your little attitude right on the way into work in the morning. You know, we all kind of met out in the parking lot and done that thing. Or in the evenings when we got off, we all kind of went to here or there and done a little self medicating to help us get through. You know what I'm talking about? Those kind of things. And you quickly you realize I've got to get away from this. I'm never going. I'm never going to make it. I'm never going to make it. So we can't always change the environment and the circumstances where those triggers are. So what we have to do is we have to begin to remove ourselves from that environment as quick as we can. Now, the promise there from God is 
that if you will make that effort to take that step, he'll honor that. He'll help you. He'll help you. He will. I can do it. He'll help you. You can't always change that environment or the circumstance. So those triggers are going to be there. And they're going to be there for the rest of our lives. They're always going to be. It's never, ever, ever going to be La La Land where everything's perfect. They're going to be there. So, triggers are those things in our daily life that tempt us or them to return to their addictive or destructive behavior. Now, listen, triggers are events that initiate thoughts, feelings, and sensations. Thoughts, feelings, and sensations. I think I told y'all a couple of weeks ago, I was in one of the grocery stores or somewhere I went to. I was walking down the aisle, my buddy minding my own business, getting stuff, and all of a sudden, this music started coming on the loudspeaker, and it was Boston, old rock band Boston, more than a feeling. Boy, and it started rocking out, and immediately in my mind, I went back to 1975 over Macon Coliseum. I was at a Boston concert. You see what I'm saying? Sights and sounds and, and smells, they all put us back into that frame of mind somehow. Principle number two says every sin has its origin in our heart. What is our heart? It's the seat of our mind, will, and emotions. So when these triggers that come along, we hear, and music is a big one. Music is a big one. It's a, it is. It's a big one. When you hear certain music and certain songs, it makes you think about certain things you used to do or certain circumstances you used to be in. That's why it's so important. I know I can't say this enough, but it sounds like sometimes we're just harping on it. You've got to pay attention to that music. It has such a powerful effect and powerful influence. But it's thoughts, feelings, and sensations. Now, here's some examples. And if you look in the book, you see if you don't, I'm sorry. I have to get you the book as quick as I can. Negative thoughts and emotions can be a trigger. Sadness, guilt, fear, anger. Every time you get mad, boy, you get mad, things are not going right. What happens? It kind of kicks you back into that mode of going back and doing that again. You know, it kind of kicks you into that mode. Uh, all of those things, anxiety. Boy, do we have anxieties today? Do we live with anxieties in our life? We certainly would do. We may not always recognize it and claim it, but we do. We all have anxieties in our life. Uh, no, uh, catastrophizing. I know that's a big ugly word that's in there, but that simply means jumping to the conclusion. Boy, we start here, and I mean, we just, somebody say this or this is taking place, or we say, boy, we just jump to the, we immediately assume the worst. We immediately assume the worst. All of those things can be triggers that cause us to want to go back to that kind of behavior, destructive behavior. People in places. Seeing someone that you used to participate in abuse or stronghold with. Just seeing somebody. Just certain people. Well, you run into your buddy you hadn't seen or your friend you hadn't seen for years and all of a sudden before you know it, you're talking about the way things used to be and boy, the way things used to be wasn't the best way and all of a sudden we're kind of transported right back into that circumstance again. Pictures, images get stored in our mind and are recalled. Images, boy, there's pictures, pictures, pictures. Go back and look at your photo of Well, now, we don't have to look at the photo of them now. We all have a phone probably yet well I mean uh, mine ain't got as many as some I probably got 2,000 pictures on my phone some I got I know I got more than that boy sometimes they're and even Facebook don't help well, what do they do about every few months or so they pop up these memory pictures if you got pictures of being in places with people that are triggered and all of a sudden bam there it is Facebook pops it up for you kind of kicks you back in that but pictures are and then it talks about uh, themes or paraphernalia. Uh, talking about themes that cause triggers or paraphernalia. I had got some stuff through Feeding the Valley that I was going to send to a, a rehab or recovery program down in Columbus. And I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to it, but there was, there was some boxes of uh, per women's personal care products, uh, shampoo and deodorants and soaps and lotions and all that kind of thing. And so I got a call from the lady down there, and she, she said, you need to be a little more careful about what you send down. And I thought, what are you, what are you talking about? So when 
I went down there and see, she showed me this package that it was a package of shampoo or hair conditioner or something, but it was made with, with hemp, a hemp product. And it had pictures of hemp leaf, which is a picture of what? A marijuana leaf. And she said, boy, when you're dealing with people in, you know, in rehab here like we are in this recovery program, the, just a picture of it like that can be a trigger. And see, all of those things are triggers that cause us to, and we'll get to some scripture in just a minute that points that out. And then again, it mentions sound, which is basically music. So when you hear certain music, certain songs, they teach you with radio stations. Now hey, look, it's not all rock and roll either. Country Western. I mean, they're all just as bad. It's just as bad. We have to be careful. So, so talks about the next question we would ask then. What about a trigger? What happens to a trigger? A trigger, when nurture takes on a life of its own. Now, let's think about that word, nurture, for just a minute. That word nurture means to take care of. Uh, it takes to take care of and, and to encourage development. Think about our children. We nurture our children. We should. We take care of them. We encourage their development. And some, the older they get, the more we encourage them. We try to encourage them to get on out of the house and get going. Or they're old enough, right? So nurture. And it talks about nurturing a trigger. Why in the world would we want to nurture a trigger? Why would we want to take care of it? Why would we want to have that development for it? You know why? Because we want to have that backup plan. And we want to have that excuse ready for when we fall. We want to have that ready for when we... Yeah. Trigger when nurture takes on a life of its own, it becomes a preoccupation. In other words, it distracts us. That's all we think about. And we're not just talking about drugs and alcohol, and we're talking about destructive behavior, stubborn strongholds, bitterness, rage, anger, jealousy, criticalness, fake thinking, and thinking, all those things. They distract us from holding on to it. Now, in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, if you're not looking at it, if you don't have your Bible, shame on you. <clears throat> but if you do, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We have used this scripture, you've heard me quote it many, 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 many times. And a lot of you know it by heart, and you should, because this speaks directly to this idea of trigger. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 speaks directly to this idea of trigger. Things that would cause us to want to look back or go back or return to addictive or destructive behavior. Stubborn strongholds. Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, and we do, remember we're saved, but we still walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. It's now a spiritual battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly things that we can do, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse number five. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That speaks directly to trigger. Scriptural. When that trigger comes about, whatever it may be, a sound, a smell, a sight, a person, a feeling, a sensation, whatever it is, when that trigger comes about, we have immediately got to understand that that's a spiritual thing and we have to have God to pull that down in our life. Now, if we've never trusted Christ our Savior, we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit there to do that. We're going to still be trying to battle it in the flesh. But if we got the power of the Holy Spirit living in us, notice what the scripture says. It says pulling down to strongholds. It says casting down everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Now, the moment we trusted Christ as our Savior, we realize that He can and I can. That's what salvation is all about. He saved me, not me saved Him. He can and I can. It's all about who He is. It's all about his strength and his power and his overcoming. So when this trigger comes about, then we immediately have to 
cast it down, pull it, throw it away. Ask God to take it away from us. Because we can't deal with it in our flesh. Now, along the way, if we'll be diligent to do what we can do, which means not put ourselves in that circumstance, not listen to that kind of music anymore, not watch those kind of pictures on TV and movies anymore, not go hang out with that crowd anymore. We do what we can do in our flesh to remove ourselves. Then God will honor our efforts and our heart, and he'll help us to pull down anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God in a saved life and in a life of recovery says, I am recovered because of the power of Christ living in me. That's the knowledge of God. And you got to tell Satan that. you got to cast it down. you got to be, let him be the defeater, not you be the, trying to be the defeater. He says you cast it down, imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So you see, when we got this idea of triggers, there is a scriptural reference right there that will help us understand. Hey, if nothing else, when you're approached or when you're confronted with that situation, when that trigger comes into play, pull out this verse. And say, God, I can't deal with this. This trigger, this emotion, this sense, this feeling, this picture, this song, whatever it is, is trying to drag me back. Take it away from me. Take it away. In fact, that word casting has just exactly the kind of connotation. It means to throw. It's like over there in First Peter where Peter said, cast your cares upon him. It means to literally just throw them. No means to lay them down. No means to just walk away from them. Literally just so we have to ask God to throw these thoughts out of my head. Remember, every sin has its origin in our heart. Remember, we're thinking about it before we ever do it. We've got to get ourselves away from that thinking about it. If these responses are not handled appropriately, they all lead to addictive. Here's kind of the process. There's the trigger, whatever it is, a sight, a sound, a smell, whatever. The trigger, and then the thought process starts. That's when you immediately got to employ 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Immediately when that thought process starts. That thought process leads to a craving. Like then you become, that's all you want to do. That's all you want to think about. It distracts you from everything else. And then that craving leads to an activity. So you see there's steps there. Anytime we have instructions and we have steps, we follow those steps. But there's always a place in there somewhere where we want to get off track. So we just simply need to follow those steps. When that trigger comes into play, whatever it is, immediately. Track the printing. Chapter 10. Immediately. And stop it. Stop the process right there. And like I said, if you have been diligent about doing what you can do, removing yourself from the situation, not, not giving place to the devil, not putting yourself in that place, if you'll be diligent in doing those things that you can do, then God will intervene in your behalf in these other places because he's seen you with these words. During the craving, uh, the talks about the longing for things, and uh, finally there's the bottom. Anytime we allow a trigger to produce a thought and a craving leading to an activity, it will affect our relationship with others and God. Never play around with triggers and addictive behavior. Never. That's why that lady called me up and said, we can't even have this here with this picture on it. Just the picture of a marijuana leaf. We don't even want to go there. We don't even want to get close to it. We don't even want to think about it because that leads. Everybody's not at the same place. So next week we'll talk a little bit more about triggers and we'll finish up on triggers and we'll get that last one in and then we're ready to start back at the beginning of the book. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for these few minutes. Lord, I pray that there's some here tonight that would need to hear these words in this scripture about how to deal with these triggers in our life. And Lord, I pray that we all realize it's not always drugs and alcohol. Many times, many, many times it's stubborn, destructive behavior. Whether it be anger, bitterness, or jealousy, or rage, or, or whatever it may be, it's destructive behavior. And Lord, I pray you help us all recognize and realize that these triggers are important and they're not something to be played around with. We should immediately cast them down when they come in contact. So I thank you for these that gather here tonight. I pray this message, these words will fall in the heart exactly where it needs to. If anyone here has a question, then they'll be sure to get that question answered before they leave tonight. Thank you for our time of fellowship, the food that's been prepared. I pray you to bless and encourage you.